Lying between desert and ocean, Namibia has exceptional natural resources, which have, to date, remained unexploited. The purity of its landscapes is due to the nature of the ground and the dryness of the air. Depending on its composition, desert soil can take on very different appearances. On the bare earth, there is nothing to prevent erosion. Man, too, imposes his guidelines on the wide open country. Over 1,500 kilometers, the Atlantic Ocean washes desert regions where life takes on rather original vegetal shapes. In difficult conditions, plants reduce their water consumption to a minimum by keeping a low profile. The vast open spaces are particularly suited to carnivorous animals that allow humans to get quite close. Among the big felines one sees in Namibia, there's the largest colony of cheetahs in Africa. Like lions, they live in an environment where prey is plentiful. There are two ways for them to protect themselves. Either they blend into the landscape or they run away each in his own time. Cold ocean waters harbor a varied fauna along the shores of a country where animals are perfectly adapted to their environment. Some species are hard to approach, so it's always a joy when it is possible to get close to them. Namibia became independent in 1990, having previously been part of South Africa. The population is primarily Bantu, they make up a wide linguistic group who live mainly in the southern half of the African continent. With two million inhabitants, population density in Namibia is among the lowest in the world. Nearly a hundred years of South African presence, with its system of apartheid, has left its mark. Like, for example, the townships, working-class neighborhoods reserved for non-whites. English is the official language, but it is only spoken by a minority. Vestiges of various cultures reflect the country's colonial past. This is also the case with architecture, where European influences are very noticeable. Right in the middle of modern rectilinear buildings, traces of colonial Germany attest to their Protestant inspiration. Christians are in the majority. Namibia is sitting on considerable wealth beneath the surface. High quality diamonds are mined here. They represent 40% of the country's export revenue. Namibia is one of the largest producers of African diamonds. Barely 1% of the land is suitable for farming. Sparse wild vegetation allows nomadic herds to be raised in semi-desert conditions. As for the craft industry, all the raw material is found in nature. Metal, wood, stones, earth, dyes and textile fibers. Namibia is the fourth largest African exporter of ore, if we don't include petroleum products. The country arouses keen interest from industrial groups that invest, for example, in the desalinization of seawater. Their presence in the country is no coincidence. In fact, Namibia is one of the five largest uranium producers in the world. Economic development is linked to the development of tourism. Namibia has an enormous tourist potential. This sector helps stimulate activity in the whole country and prospects are promising. The country's natural heritage is a huge asset for the tourist industry. Hotel complexes are taking advantage of this by trying to integrate with nature, and in so doing, they put the tourist in direct contact with an environment both untouched and preserved. Namibia is the wellspring of the original adventure. At almost 1,700 meters altitude, Vinduk lies right in the middle of the country. The city is centered around one main thoroughfare, Vinduk served as capital at various times in the country's history, and since independence has remained so. Namibia is a republic with a president elected by universal suffrage and a parliament. The country's institutions are influenced by the different cultures that have been present here. This is also true of its architecture. 
The old colonial period is evident in many places. The old station in the city centre is still in use. Northern European Lutheran architecture has adapted to another latitude. It's an obvious contrast to a modern city that has been forced to grow upward to meet the demands of expansion. The name Windhoek is well chosen. In Dutch, it is literally windy corner. As for the standard of living, the income per inhabitant is among the highest in the African continent. In the capital, consumerism and quality of life go hand in hand. The city has preserved both its provincial charm and its commitment to nature. On the city's outskirts, the township of Catutural rekindles memories of a tortured past. Townships bring people together in ethnic groups. For example, the Hereros, one of the large ethnic groups in Namibia. The women wear a characteristic headdress. Racial segregation here is often attributed to the South Africans. But it was, in fact, instigated by the Germans in the 19th century. The urban pull is strong in Namibia. 40% of the population live in towns. Separation between races can be seen in the division of lands. The best land is used for raising cattle. For the most part, it belongs to whites. Wood is widely used for cooking. This is an African reality that unfortunately leads to desertification. Traveling south, the road crosses countryside with a considerable amount of wildlife. Domestic animals make do mostly with the grass growing beside the roads. The Kalahari Desert stretches on both sides of the Tropic of Capricorn. The word desert doesn't really apply to the Kalahari because it isn't entirely devoid of vegetation. Birds take refuge there, especially in the sort of collective nests built by a small bird, the sociable weaver. The coat of the springbok, the jumping antelope, is a marvel of imitation. It looks very much like the grasses of the Kalahari. The Bushmen are the oldest inhabitants of southern Africa, and yet they have often been marginalized. For millennia, the Bushmen, or the San, have lived in a land they know perfectly. It can be days or weeks, it can be months that they are going out for hunting. So it's not very easy for them to find a springbok or pika antelopes like kudu or oryx. Their skill is legendary. So if they come back from the hunting, if they are successful, they make a large fire and then after eat it, that's the time they are dancing. For the Bushmen, the Kalahari Desert has unlimited resources. For example, how to use the pods of the Acacia areobola, or camel thorn tree. So the cocoon, they can use as a musical instrument or a smoking. A smoking, when it is dry, when it is nice open, they make a small hole here and then they put tobacco in, they light it, and each and every one of them can say it. Bushmen are never caught off their guard. In rainy seasons, when they're doing the hunting, they carry in ostrich eggs water. And when the water of them is finished, they make sure they, uh, they find out whether there is water or not. If there is water, they look for a tree with got nice hollow branches. They collect five or four, and then they make a fire, they heat it up, the inner part of the, of the branch, they take it out. And then the, the white powder is inside, they blow it out. So when the serving straw is, is clean, they make a hole 
And then with the serving straw, each and every one of them drinks the water. The language the Bushmen speak is a click language, using certain consonants that in fact have very practical origins. We use mostly click sounds to speak, and they have four different click sounds are very uh, more likely to be used, and it's the first one is, and then second one, third one, fourth one, and the click sound actually came from the mimicking of the animal sound that they, when they were hunting or they hear the sound from animals, they tried to imitate. So it was easier for them when they are hunting, they sound like the animal and the animal might respond to it. The Bushmen, a people and a culture that need to be preserved. In the reserves, wild animals are used to seeing vehicles go by. But their instincts are unchanged and antelopes scatter as if they were on springs. The reserve means animals can be observed in their natural environment. Most of them show no fear, as vehicles mostly stay on the track. Some animals are easier to see than others. Today, the lions are hiding. How can they be found? Follow their tracks. The smaller tracks that you can see here, that's for the female. If you go more, to the front side, the bigger trucks, that ones are for the male, it's the male trucks. It may take a long time looking, but the effort is always worth it. I can see one male and one female. The male is lying down and the female is standing up. Although seemingly serene, these big cats remain very vigilant. You always have to keep an eye on them because their reactions can be very quick. It's a Kalari lion, especially the male. The male, he grew up here, he born here. It's only the female that come from Etosa. The male, he born here, that is his area. The male is now 14 years old and the female is now 8 years old. South of Vinduk, the area of Marintal owes its name to a German colonist's wife. The Namibian railway network was already in existence before the First World War. In the Kokoboom forest, we find some very strange plants. They contain a sap that allows them to resist extreme temperatures and dryness. They're called kokobooms, which in Afrikaans means quiver tree. Quiver is actually a family of the alue. It's called the alue dicotoma because of the two branches that the, the branch always divides in two. And the quiver, because of the uh, some people were using the dried out branches like this. They hollow out the fiber inside and they could use it as their pockets to put in the arrows. So they carry it like this empty and then they can just use it from there and they can shoot. The quiver tree has other uses too. And usually their water is stored in the trunk as a sponge, she fiber inside helps them to store it. And the leaves are like an aloe, contains a lot of water, and sometimes used as a medicine also. The quiver tree benefits from the nearby black rocks because of the heat they store. The magmatic rocks come from the terrestrial magna, unlike volcanic rock. 
They form piles that have been sculpted by erosion and left balancing precariously. The intense heat and sandstorms have broken down the layout of the giant's playground. The shows that nature puts on are sometimes almost excessive. For example, the Fish River Canyon. It's the world's second largest canyon after the Grand Canyon in Colorado. At the bottom of the gorge, Fish River stops flowing in the dry season. When the German colonists arrived here, there were no points of reference, so they created them themselves, naming places after their wives. This was how Maltehohe was named. Today it's mainly inhabited by the Nama people. The Nama are one of Namibia's original ethnic groups. The German colonists wanted to get rid of them or chase them off their lands, to no avail. Brian Pandwick started a cultural center whose aim is to preserve the Nama culture. The singing and dancing is, is very uh, uh, present in Nama culture. It's, it's very intense. Uh, all Nama people have a beautiful voice. They all sing well. And, and, and this is really the, 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 the most beautiful thing that they, they can offer. It's, uh, it's a set of, of Nama songs with, uh, with, with the clicks, the special uh, clicks of the Nama culture, the Nama language. Songs can bring a community together. A lot of the, the singing happens in, uh, in church, uh, around church religious gatherings, uh, also for, for weddings, for uh, special occasions, uh, uh, community gathering. Uh, people sing very easily in the, in the Nama community. And it's something which is very natural uh, and, and, and very widespread. You need many superlatives to describe the Namib Naukluft National Park. It's Namibia's largest nature reserve and one of the largest national parks in the world. It's situated in the Namib Desert, thought to be the oldest on the planet. The Sosuzvle dunes are among the highest in the world and they can rise to over 300 meters. The sand they're composed of does not only come from the ocean. It was formed over millennia by the combined action of the sun and the wind on ancient sandstone. The color of this fine sand is of specific origin. These dunes are very much unique. First of all, in the color, you can see it's a very red sand, which contains a lot of iron oxide that makes the dunes look red in color. The contours of the landscape are constantly evolving. The dune sand, the shape changes all the time with the wind. And in the area where you have got just a few uh, wind, the track starts to move away. And today when you come, the shape might be like this. When the east wind blow, the shape changes again with the wind. So the shape changes quite a lot. Wind is not a danger to the dunes. It can even be considered an asset. The dunes can never disappear because it's a constant, the sand is constantly being moved in from the ocean. So there is no way that these dunes will disappear anytime. When you walk on the sand, you leave tracks. 
Is that not a problem for the environment? To leave the tracks in the sand is not a problem. As the wind comes, the tracks goes away in few minutes, if not seconds. So this will not be a problem. It practically never rains in the Namib desert, but a mere few drops are enough to revive vegetation, even when it looks completely dried up. Just with a little bit of water, this area, whole area turns green because of abundance of uh, sunlight, so it's very easy for plants to grow quickly. In just a few seconds, a plant that looked dead gives signs of life again. This one is already open. It was right this one before, closed like this. And just a bit of water on it, and it opens up in this shape. Life in a hostile environment is much more intense than it appears to be. In order to survive, creatures have to be very quick. The shuffle snowed lizard, very sharp nose. It helps the lizard to dive quickly into the sand to avoid the predators. And this little lizard also, it does the, the thermal dance, we call it. When the sand becomes very, very hot, it, um, it picks up two diagonal legs on this side. And then up, when it cools down, it change. And then, and then change to the other one, so it looks like it's dancing. At the foot of Big Daddy, the world's highest dune, stretches the dead flay. A clay basin marks the bed of an ancient river. Little by little, the dunes have prevented the water from flowing. Acacias once grew, but could not hold out when the water disappeared. The wood is so dry now, it doesn't decompose. The trunks are thought to be a thousand years old. Temporary rivers always leave a trace of their passage. In this way, the Sesraim River carved a kilometer-long canyon into the rock. On ground that is very dry and very hard, river flooding is sudden and extreme. The water rises in a few minutes and attacks the rock walls. Outside the rare rainy periods, the canyon can be crossed on foot. Despite the difficult conditions, man can live in the desert. He can even enjoy all sorts of activities. It's 5 a.m. and a giant mushroom appears out of the sand. The hot air balloon affords an unbeatable view over the desert. The inside of the balloon has to be heated before it will rise. After that, it's very simple. Once the wind takes us in that direction, that's the way we go. The balloon moves slowly across the Sosusvle region, southwest of Vinduk. We're really on the edge of the desert, and right now we're between the mountains, the plain, and the dunes. The balloon travels silently, so it's an excellent observation post. Even more so since the animals here are not afraid. The animals are pretty laid back because there's no hunting in the region. There's been no hunting for 20 years, so the animals are not wary of humans. We can't control the direction, but we can choose the altitude. We're going down among the trees. When it rains, some rivers flow for a couple of days and then cease to exist. They just seem to vanish. We're going to make a quick 360. When seen from above, the ground sometimes produces strange surprises. 
Here, next to the dunes, we can see the fairy circles. They look like little circles and nothing grows inside them. It is still a big mystery or a fairy tale. In my opinion, it is a fungus. But some scientists think they are produced by termites or the Earth's radioactivity. There are different theories, but it's still a big mystery. For those flying over it, nature becomes at once mysterious and seductive. To come back down to Earth, the procedure is simple. We have to let the temperature inside the balloon drop, but not too much so as to avoid hitting the ground too hard. So we have to keep around a 50 degrees differential between the temperature within the balloon's envelope and the outside ambient temperature. At this moment, we heat less and less until we land. The landing is perfect when we manage to touch down on the trailer. Thank you, guys. Position good. Coming down. There we go. All that remains is to put the gear away. But before leaving, you have to bow to tradition. The sumptuous <laughs> breakfast buffet with champagne. Careful in the front there. It gets a little bit dangerous. One, two, off it goes. In the old days, you offered champagne to the owner of the land you came down on to make up for the inconvenience. The desert has plenty of surprises in store. Isolation. This is a meeting place in the middle of nowhere. meeting place for travelers after a long journey and for squirrels and birds. Some come from afar to taste Moose McGregor's apple tart. Yeah, we bake uh, a world-renowned apple pie that's taken 24 years to, to get there and a variety of other nice cakes and biscuits and homemade breads. I have a, a famous moose bread with many seeds in it, and it's called a country loaf. But there's not only apple tart. This we are still processing, we're making pizza, and this is the end product in the stove. It's American cinnamon rolls, and this is called cheese twirls made with barbecue. The appearance of the desert, depending on the place, can change completely. It's usually the nature of the rocks that decides. The Quiseb Canyon was carved out by a temporary river. But the rock put up a stern resistance and only opened up with great reluctance. This is a very slow process that's hard to measure, even over a man's lifetime. The desert is not a vast, empty space. Quite the reverse. It is teeming with life. At Walvis Bay, the dunes of the desert come right up to the Atlantic Ocean. Walvis Bay is the only place on the coast suitable for a deep water port. Here, the marine fauna is very sociable, but is not without an ulterior motive. If he takes, just to show you, look at that, he can pack away every day 200 grams of fish. Cormorants, pelicans and gulls line up to have a taste.
Along the coasts, marine fauna is plentiful and varied. And the reason is to be found in the temperature of the Atlantic Ocean. In this latitude, the water is cold and rich in plankton. The grey whale, among other species, feeds on this. A cold current comes up from the Antarctic. It keeps the water at a temperature that's particularly appreciated by the seals. The seal is also a very sociable animal, not to say a bit intrusive. It's very quick to invite itself for a meal. The Wolvis Bay salt marshes are fed by the ocean's cold water. As it reaches land, the water temperature rises rapidly. So there's intense evaporation. This explains an impressive salt production, which can be as much as 12 tons an hour. These shallow waters also contain organic substances fed on by thousands of pink flamingos in Dorob National Park. People with a liking for thrills will find what they want in the dunes. The vast stretches of sand become the playground for off-road vehicles. In theory, mechanical activities of this sort have no lasting effect on the environment, because a bit of strong wind immediately erases every trace. Some places are to be avoided because the sand can be treacherous. The ocean is very close, and the coast used to receive many visitors. And we are right here at Sandwich Harbor. It forms a big bay in this area. It's renowned for the dunes and the ocean meeting. The reason why this became known as Sandwich Harbor is because this area was a big freshwater wetland area and your ships that used to catch whales came down the coastline to come and anchor here for the fresh water that they could find. Today, the ocean has eaten away everything in its path, all the wetlands up to the dunes. Between the ocean and the dunes, the pink flamingos give man a lesson in elegance that commands respect. The desert can teach us so many things. Every dune has a tale to tell. For example, like this plant over here, that is a nara plant. You can find it on top of dunes because their roots can grow up to 40 meters in length. The desert is astonishingly rich. It harbors plant species that are found nowhere else. And it's a family just like a pumpkin. Uh, then you can eat it. And this one is not ripe. When it's ripe, it becomes orange inside. And then, you know, it's a little bit uh, sweet. Yeah? and then you can eat it. And the animals eat it because of all this water inside. When they do like this, you see, there's water coming out. You see the water dripping out from it. So that's why the name Nara Melon comes in. The jackal plays an important role in the desert. It's omnivorous and helps to maintain the balance of nature. The Swakop River, yet another intermittent watercourse, carved out Moon Valley. The river did not have to force its way through the soft rock. It spread widely and has been leveling the landscape for thousands of years. 
Beside the ocean, the Skeleton Coast owes its name to the whale carcasses that the fishermen left on the beach after stripping off the flesh. Today, the whales have disappeared to be replaced by a few wrecked boats. Damaraland has no direct access to the ocean and was formerly a self-governing territory. It became part of Namibia just before independence. In the desert, nature can take on very special forms. It's up to man to interpret them as best he can. The ladies of the Herero ethnic group wear strange flat hats which are made to look like a cow's horns. In fact, the cow enjoys great prestige in Herero culture. The organ pipes. Molten rock, as it cools down, can solidify into geometrical shapes. This phenomenon happened when Africa and South America split apart some 200 million years ago. Burnt Mountain is evidence of the contact between terrestrial magna and organic matter. In Namibia, the Earth's memory can be read out in the open under a clear sky. A clear blue sky where Jupiter does not pass unnoticed. In Namibia, stones and plants sometimes merge. But the trees of the petrified forest came from elsewhere. These uh, trees of the branches that are here have been deposited over 280 million years ago by the big floods when the ice age melted and the trees were washed down. The trees were said to have been growing in the central Africa. In Kamanjab, thousands of years ago, man drew an impression of his environment. Using rock paintings, an artist named San drew up a complete inventory of local fauna. It's a real catalogue of the living world. The trail leads to the village of Ochikandero, here live members of the Himba ethnic group. The Himba coat their skin and their hair in a red mixture of animal fat and hematite, a very common mineral with a high iron oxide content. The object is aesthetic but also practical because the skin is thus protected from the sun and from insects. The Himba are related to the Hereros. Their hairstyles, too, are inspired by cow's horns. Livestock is a measure of social rank. The girls, some of them, they got only one ponytail like this one, but only one on the front side. Uh, or sometimes two like this, or sometimes four. Two on the back here, and two on the front. Uh, the boys, they can have one like this one, but only one straight at the backside. The black rhino is indifferent to the presence of the oryx. It has excellent hearing but very poor eyesight. Herbivores take no notice of each other. Etosha is a national park, one of the biggest nature reserves in Namibia, a wildlife sanctuary. 
Etosha National Park was created at the beginning of the 20th century when Namibia was still a German colony. This open area was a lake that has dried up, the Etosha Pan. In Etosha, we've got um, a lot of animals, like what we have here, the zebras. These are the betel zebras in the springbok. Uh, the gnus just uh, drank also. And elephants, rhinos, lions, uh, elant, all different kinds of animals that you can find in Edusha. Every zebra has a different stripe, just like the fingerprint of a human being. The zebras are also different, each zebra. The Atosha Park is one of the biggest and one of the richest animal reserves in the world. It's prohibited to stray off the trails, and some animals stick conscientiously to the rules. The black-faced impala is an endangered species. This is not true of the warthog. There are more than 100 species of mammals alone. In the dry season, the easiest place to observe the animals is around the watering places. When you go through the Etosha Park, you do it to come into close contact with the origins of Africa, with beautiful, powerful nature. The elephants are savanna elephants. They are bigger than the other African species, the mountain elephants. The giraffe spends over 12 hours a day grazing. Its diet consists of about 100 different plants, but it tends to prefer the acacia. Spotted hyenas live in clans. Each clan is dominated by the female. Namibia has altogether about 20 national parks and protected areas. It thus makes up an inexhaustible reserve of wildlife. As you travel north, the landscape is dotted with termite nests. To build them, the termites use a mixture of their saliva and earth, which cooks in the sun. Omutia is a small town in the north of the country. It was created from nothing and only very recently has been recognized as a town. It lives on passing trade on a very busy road running to Angola. The area used to be of strategic interest. At Namutone, the German colonial army built a fort. In the north, the working of the land bore fruit, for the soil is rich. However, underground, the region is even richer. As green as it is prosperous, Tsumeb is one of the most important mining towns in the country. While the drought wreaks havoc in other places, this town has grass growing everywhere. Tsumeb has been nicknamed Paradise because of its assets. Every Sunday, the faithful come to divine service. The place of worship belongs to an important community of the Protestant religion, the Apostolic Church.
Still in the north of the country, in the region of Ochiwangaro, there are a few guides who use a very strange piece of equipment. This is the radio telemetry which we normally use to track the cats that are in the park. The felines in question are leopards, which are very stealthy animals. In such a vast area, although some have been fitted with a transmitter, it isn't always easy to find them. So, are we getting closer? Not yet. <laughs> but we're still in the bush, so we'll see. The guides rely on each other, and it would seem that a colleague has located one of the big cats. The leopard is surprised to have so many admirers. This is Electra, one of our female leopards, who is around two and a half years old. If you look at the pink nose, that shows that's a young leopard. The leopard is often mistaken for another feline that also inhabits the area. It's just walking around, maybe having a morning early exercise. The cheetah is an inquisitive animal. It's OK. It's OK. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Stop it. Hey. Ah, ah. Stop it. The cheetah is the fastest mammal on the planet. So today, somebody's going to come and feed them at some point. The cheetah is an endangered species and it doesn't much like competition from other cats. It's unbeatable in a race because it is light and supple, but it's not very good at defending itself. Its one great advantage is in the way it changes direction at lightning speed. A foundation called AfriCat has been set up for the conservation of felines. Come on, my baby. Come on, you're a darling. Come, 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 come. We're going to come and visit you. Yes, 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 yes. Donna Hansen is the director. Come and show everybody how beautiful you are. Come, Moti Moti. Hello, my girl. So here we have two males and two sisters, brothers, sisters. These cheetahs are different from others. They've been through an astonishing adventure and were very lucky at the beginning of their lives. These cheetahs cannot be released back into the wild and they get used as our educational ambassadors. They don't, um, they cannot be freed because they were hand raised. Their mother was shot by a farmer and when the farmer came to the dead body, he saw the stomach move and he realized she was going to give birth. So he cut the stomach open and these little four babies popped out. They look just like big pussycats, but be careful. They are wild, unpredictable animals. We use them to get the children to admire the species, but they don't ever need to touch a wild animal. We don't believe in any wildlife and human-wild animal contact. A wild animal has instincts that domestic animals don't have and they can turn on you in two seconds. These cheetahs have in fact lost their instinctive fear of man. They are more dangerous than if they were in the wild. The AfriCat Foundation plays an educational role by placing the animals in their context. It also explains, especially to children, the balance to respect between human activity and wildlife. It also ensures the health care of the cats. Cheetahs need a huge expanse to hunt in. As for feeding, they don't differentiate between a cow and an antelope. So they sometimes attack livestock, and the farmers kill them in defense of their property. That's the challenge, to establish mutual respect through education. So when children come to Okanjima, we don't just talk about cheetahs and leopards, we talk about the ecosystem, the balance, why you need a balance on the land, why you need to protect from the cheetah to the antelope, to the grass, to the land, to the water, which trees you do cut, which trees you should never cut, which grasses mean your land is good, which grasses mean your land is overstocked, and, and why the predator is important in the big picture. Between man and nature, Namibia has for thousands of years established spontaneous and regular exchanges. 
This has inculcated traditions from which the wildlife reaps the benefit. This is the start of the trail of the original adventure.